the ZX Spectrum is an iconic 80s computer. But loading from tape can be a pain in the doodads. There are devices to speed up loading, like DivMMCs in a variety of guises. But we're going to take a different route and build the Dandonator Mini 2.1 by Dan Dare. Right now. Mark fixes stuff. This video is sponsored by PCBWay. You can get an instant quote on a variety of services, or browse a library of talented makers' designs, add them to your cart, and have them delivered directly to your door. The Dandonator Mini is an easy to build flash RAM interface for the ZX Spectrum. It requires the following components a 1N4148 Xena diode, two 1 kilo ohm 5% 1 quarter watt resistors, five 100 nanofarad capacitors, three assorted sockets, which will fill with these three chips a PIC 16F1826, a GAL 22V10D, and an SST 39SF040. We'll need a DB9 socket for joystick support, a pair of tactile switches and two header pins, a suitable edge connector for the Spectrum. This one's too large and will need to be modified for the board. Let's build it. First, we'll need to clean the board with isopropyl alcohol. This will remove any grease, grit or grime that might hinder our soldering. Once the board is clean, we can start to place our components. First, that single diode. Diodes have a polarity, so be sure to align the stripe for the negative cathode to the marking on the board. The two resistors are not polarised and can go in any way round. We'll place those in next. We bend over the component leads to stop them dropping out of the board when we turn it over for soldering. With these in place, we can do our first spot of soldering. The iron is set to 330 degrees Celsius, my usual working temperature. I'm using my all-purpose 3.5mm chisel tip on this project. It allows me to easily make contact with the board and the component leg at the same time. It's good practice to apply the solder to the heated joint where the component and board meet, rather than the tip of the iron. That being said, a small amount of solder on the soldering tip can aid heat transfer to the component and the board as well. It's a balancing act. With the soldering done, we clip off the remaining leads. Always being careful not to apply too much mechanical stress to the new joints whilst pulling or clipping. Next, we're going to install the 100 nanofarad capacitors. But there's a problem. You see, when I insert them into the board like this, I realise that I've ordered the wrong size and they won't fit as is. Luckily, with a bit of persuasion, we can remove a small amount of the ceramic coating, making the leads fit into the board. That should do it. Don't hate me, YouTube. I've done the other four capacitors as well. I'll insert them into the board whilst hiding my embarrassed face. With the fifth capacitor <coughs> neatly fitted, we can solder them into place. And never mention this ever again. Sometimes people think I edit my videos to make myself look good. Obviously, I don't. Right, let's move on to getting the sockets installed. First, the one for the PIC microcontroller. I 
I'll be using my special ball of smurf poo to hold the socket in place whilst the board is inverted. Soldering a socket is pretty simple stuff, but you do need to try and limit the amount of time you hold the iron on the pin. This is called dwell time. If you dwell on a pin too long, you'll start to melt the socket. Once we're done, we remove the blue goo, leaving the socket perfectly installed. We'll use the same process for the 32 pin PLCC socket. Take note of the key corner when installing. The key corner is marked here on the board. Place the socket, entering all the holes at once. Any resistance means you've gone in the wrong hole. When soldering these sockets, it's easy to lose track of where you've been. The shiny soldering grid array of the pins can make you go goggle-eyed. Always check you've done each pin and add a little more solder if required. Removing the Smurf Dung, the 32-pin PLCC socket looks good to go. Now the 24-pin GAL socket. GALs or generic array logic chips are an old technology now, but still plentiful in supply. I'll speed up the soldering from now on. Again, watch your dwell time. Great. Next, these two jumpers. Actually, this one is really a serial programming header. The left pin is ground and the right pin is TX, and you can use them for updating the flash RAM. They're breakouts of pins 4 and 8 respectively on the joystick board. This is simply a jumper to enable or disable the Kempston joystick interface. They look good. If the tack gets warm, it can get a bit melty, so clean up by dabbing your area again. Tactile switch time. These momentary clicky marvels will only fit the board the correct way. When ordering, pay attention to the post length. You need a couple of long ones to satisfy the needs of this project. If the post is too short, you'll find yourself fumbling around for the switch. The Kempston port is provided by a standard DB9 socket. These are really easy to install and even have retaining clips that keep the port flush to the PCB. I fill the clip holes first, because this adds a lot of mechanical strength. On a joystick port that will have a lot of insertions, I tend to fill both the holes. On this one, I didn't make good contact with the board, just the pins. I'll make sure to do better on this one and heat everything. That one looks a lot nicer. And I also reflowed the bodged one. Better, but still uggers. Soldering the pins is just standard stuff. Okay, that was the easy part of the board. Now we need to adapt and install the edge connector. Time to modify the edge connector. We need to lose two sets of pins, one from each side. 
your connector might vary, so make sure to count that you're leaving 28 pairs or 56 pins in total. We'll finish up with this polishing wheel. First we'll pull out the end pins. Using a pair of grips or snips, we have a good tug. It leaves a perfect space to cut into afterwards. Do the same for the other end if you have a 60 pin connector like me. Now we can cut off both ends. I find the best method is to cut into the now evacuated pin apertures. Once you've cut into both sides you can simply pull your end off. Usually the material these are made of is relatively soft and easy to pare down. Use sharp snips and wear eye protection as the bits can ping up into your face. Just take it steady and you'll easily get the end of the connector into a workable form. We'll do the same for the other end. With both ends trimmed, this would actually be enough to fit the Spectrum already. But why not use the power of Grindy McGrindface? The polishing wheel on this is very useful and I use it for a lot of restorations. It does create a lot of dust though so I'm wearing a face mask. It's basically a light abrasive but can go through plastic very quickly. I find it a lot less melty than a sander or a grinding wheel, but you can just use a file or a sanding block at home. That's good enough for me. You can see on my hands the plastic dust that's been kicked up. Ok, it might not be perfect, but it's good enough for a home project like this. You may have noticed that the fifth pin is missing on a Spectrum. We need to remove that pair of pins as well and make a key to prevent misinsertion. On this Div MMC by Zaxxon we can see a fancy metal pin. I don't have anything like that, so I'm going to use a piece of perf board glued into place. First, let's pull these pins. Get the right ones because these won't go back. With that removed, we need to stuff something rigid into the hole. This perf board will do fine. It's easy to cut and quite solid. We'll fix it in with a bit of super glue. Job done. I'm going to have a quick clean up now. With the edge connector prepared, we need to solder it to our board. With the connector on a flat surface, bend the pins inward. Not quite 45 degrees, but close. Then do the other side. It needs to look like this with a gap down the middle. As you can see the pins won't slide onto the board from the front. You need to just hook them over the corner of the board and slide them down. Wiggling as you go will help the pins to slip on. Some of the pins may get a little bent, but don't worry, we can straighten them out afterwards. Align the top side of the pins. Then straighten any bent pins if needed. That looks pretty good and the connector is held on by tension alone. Try to leave a small gap between the connector and the edge of the board, so we can straighten the connector as we solder if needed. I might change that key later, it looks a bit rough. Next we solder both ends on the top side of the interface only. Once they're fixed, we're able to make sure that the edge connector is lined up nicely. 
and solder both ends on the underside of the interface as well. Once we're happy with the alignment, we can proceed to solder all the other edge connector pins into place. Make sure that each pin gets a decent amount of solder to keep the entire edge connector strong. Then solder the underside. If you enjoy this video, please consider becoming a patron. Details at the link below. The connector is finished and physically rigid. And now the entire board is ready. All we have to do is program the chips we need and then we are good to go. First we'll program the 512k flash with the Mini Pro programmer. ROM sets are created with the utility from the Dandonator website. It's drag and drop and you can even update the board using the PC connected to the ear socket of the Spectrum. Pretty handy, eh? Alternatively, you can export to a DivIDE compatible tap file and update that way, but we'll simply create a ROM image and flash it directly to the chip. There are pre-made ROM sets and multi-load conversions on the website as well. Next, we program the GAL. This is simply using the JED files hosted with the project. Now comes the problem. The PIC chip is not supported by my Mini Pro. Rotter. Instead, I had to buy this clone PIC programmer. I also got lazy and ordered a seat to make programming less of a hassle, but it's not required. The board markings show that the 18 pin picks are placed here in this orientation. The software used for this programmer is the Microchip MP Lab Integrated Programming Environment. Once I'd ironed out a few newbie issues, including updating the firmware of the programmer, programming was easy using the files provided on the Dandonator website. With our chips chock full of bits, it's time to install them into the board. Making sure the pins are aligned with the socket, I push firmly and evenly down. Check that no legs have missed the socket. Same for the PIC microcontroller. The notch on both chips needs to match the socket and be towards the back of the interface. Finally, the flash RAM that we've pre-flashed with all of our content. It's simply a matter of pushing the chip into the PLCC socket whilst observing that the cut corners match. I'm excited to try this. The edge connector is new and a very snug fit. Popping in the power to the Spectrum and a composite cable, we flick the switch. And bingo, our Dandonator springs into life. Not bad for a first try. Although when I press the number buttons, nothing happens and it just redraws the menu. I resolve this by holding both buttons whilst powering on. This makes the Dandonator update the PIC firmware from the Flash RAM. I'm not sure, but this seems to fix the problem. Maybe it updates the memory addresses for the Flash. Trapdoor using DanTap emulation crashed the machine. The interface supports ROM, SNAP, Z80, MLD or TAP, so it's probably a matter of finding the right version. The other games work fine. Yes, Dave. I know I put it on twice. But thanks for pointing that out. With the joystick jumper in place, the Kempson interface worked without any issues. 
Paired with my Retro Radionics Arcade joystick, play was responsive and smooth. Although I was still terrible at Bonnie and Clyde. One of the best features is that by holding down the left button whilst powering on, the Dandinator bypasses the system ROM and loads ZX Spectrum Diagnostics by Brendan Alford, based on the work of Dylan Smith. This gives you a great diagnostic check of your Spectrum's hardware, and can even pinpoint specific faulty IC locations, without the need for a working keyboard. This single tool has saved dozens of Spectrums here, and it's frankly amazing. Well, this was a really fun to build project, with so many more capabilities than I could fit into this video. Big thanks to my sponsors, PCBWay, and massive gratitude to my amazing Patreon supporters. They make my work possible. If you'd like to join them in helping me create more videos, visit patreon.com forward slash markfixesstuff for details of the perks on offer. Thanks so much for watching my video. Maybe you'd like to watch another. Here's some you might enjoy. Bye.